My name is Sarah Kester and this is going to be a presentation and case study on comfort theory. Uh, comfort theory was developed in the early 1990s by Dr. Katherine Kolkama. At the time, she was a graduate nursing student who sought to define comfort for nursing practice. At the time, there were kind of broad definitions of comfort that had come from uh, multiple disciplines. Um, and she sought to get a nursing specific definition of comfort, so she did a concept analysis. Um, her theory basically surmises that there are four contexts in which comfort can occur and three types of comfort. Um, she also defined a number of topics for comfort theory, which you'll see on this slide. Uh, the first of which is comfort. She defined comfort as the satisfaction of basic human needs for relief, ease, and transcendence. Side note that these are the three types of comfort that the patient can experience. And these needs arise from a healthcare situation that is stressful. Um, comfort needs are basically whatever the patient defines them as. It could be the need for a warm blanket. Uh, if they're cold, it could be, um, of course, the alleviation of pain. Comfort measures are those interventions which we use in order to alleviate those comfort needs. Health-seeking behaviors are something we're going to discuss a little bit more in detail later in this presentation, but they are actions by the patient that move them progressively through the stages of comfort. Um, there are kind of two possibilities in this situation. Comfort theory is mostly used for um, hospice patients, but it has such a wide application it can be used in any patient care scenario. So in the situation that we're using comfort theory with a hospice patient or a terminal patient, um, we can try our best to alleviate their comfort, but physical healing may not be possible for them. So just to go back to health-seeking behaviors really quickly, um, this patient may not be able to show um, either internal or external um, health-seeking behaviors, but of course we can try to move them forward on uh, a possibility of comfort theories progressing that patient to uh, a peaceful or a most comfortable death. Um, just a side note there. Uh, Kolkawa determined that increasing patient comfort uh, would increase patient satisfaction, thereby of course increasing the institutional integrity um, of the facility that you work at. Um, intervening variables are those variables that are outside of our control. Um, whether it's the terminal diagnosis of the patient, um, financial situations, lack of family support. There are things that affect their comfort that are completely outside of our control. <clears throat> so one can experience comfort or discomfort in four different contexts, which are kind of self-explanatory. Um, physical is, of course, the physical needs of the patient, pain, cold, hunger. Um, Psycho-spiritual, which could be depression. Um, environmental and sociocultural. Environmental um, stimuli could be like noxious smells, um, loud noises, uh, constant beeping if they're in the ICU. Um, and of course, um, lastly, the sociocultural, we kind of discussed that earlier with the lack of family support. Maybe they come from an impoverished home, maybe they're homeless. Um, now the realms of comfort are relief, ease, and transcendence. It's like the three different types of comfort. Relief is defined as the alleviation of a discomfort. Um, whereas ease, the next step, is the absence of that discomfort. So the patient ex expresses a need to you, um, that is their need for relief. If we therefore satisfy that need, then they move to ease, which is the absence of that need. Um, transcendence is the final step, and that's when the patient can rise above their kind of discomfort or their, um, their diagnosis or whatever, and kind of make a positive experience, kind of make the best out of what they've got. Um, for the use of comfort theory, we typically use these contexts and types of comfort to identify where the patient is experiencing distress and then target specific comfort interventions to actually address those needs. Now the conceptual framework for comfort theory is seen here. It's also available in our book. Um, here you've got the healthcare needs of the patient or of the family if the patient can't express their own needs. Um, comforting interventions that we use, intervening variables which are those that are outside of our control. Um, and it either leads to um, enhanced comfort for the patient, which thereby they're going to express more health-seeking behaviors, or it could lead down here to a peaceful death. Um, again, our, our goal is to provide the most comfort for the patient, and sometimes these situations are out of our control. Next, we're going to see the taxonomic structure of comfort. Um, this diagram simplifies comfort theory so much and makes it so usable and relatable for nursing practice and even advanced nursing practice. Uh, the three types of comfort are listed at the top, relief, ease, and transcendence. And then, of course, the realms which the patient, or the context in which the patient can experience comfort are listed to the side. Um, just to go into this, like a physical need um, for relief would be if the patient expresses to you that they are in pain or that they are cold. Um, that intervention would go in this first box. To move forward, if you then provide um, that intervention for the patient and they of course present to you that okay I am no longer in pain or thank you that warm blanket was nice I feel much better then they're in the ease stage in the physical context 
to move forward, transcendence is when we said that this patient is able to move forward um, and actually make a positive situation out of their, their own specific scenario. So if we have made them more comfortable, we have decreased their pain level, then they are gonna be more apt to, of course, participate in health-seeking behaviors. And this is available for each of the contexts. Moving on, the application of comfort theory. <clears throat> Comfort theory is widely applicable. Um, basically, any patient care scenario, they're all stressful. These patients are sick, they're scared. Comfort theory is widely applicable. Um, it's been used in multiple languages. It's um, been used in multiple cultures. Uh, any patient population. Of course, the most commonly used is for end-of-life care, oncology, hospice. Um, but it's been applied to patient scenarios for pediatrics, for OB patients, um, just, just very widely applicable. Um, if you were a nurse taking care of a patient, chances are that this patient can benefit from comfort theory. Um, our specific case study moving on, we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. Let me just back up very quickly. Um, strategies that you can use to incorporate comfort theory. Um, there's actually a general comfort questionnaire that was developed by Catherine Kolkaba. Um, it's a series of questions that actually lets the patient tell you um, from their own words where they're at. Um, it expresses, of course, physical needs, um, emotional needs, and that way you can specifically address your care to that. The general comfort questionnaire itself has been adapted into multiple languages um, and applied to all kinds of patient populations. Um, and then actually for pediatrics, uh, Cole Cobb developed the comfort daisies here, um, which kind of lets the patient that can't maybe express exactly how they're feeling in their own words um, can tell you kind of how they feel. Um, and it's expressed with the little sad daisy over here saying that right now I feel very bad, sort of bad, sort of good or very good, um, widely applicable. You know, you have patients that are scared and hurting, they're, they're gonna benefit from comfort theory, um, all age ranges, all diagnoses. Now to move on to our case study. Um, our, case study our case study centers on a tertiary care ICU patient um, that I actually took care of um, at my first nursing job. Um, comfort theory was useful for this situation because it let us apply holistic care, not only to the patient, but to a family that was really needing it. Um, our case study was a 37 year old male that I took care of that had a diagnosis of metastatic melanoma. Um, when I first started taking care of this patient, uh, he had found out that it was met to lung, bone, brain. He was eaten up. Uh, he, admit, or he was admitted actually to the ICU after coming through the ER. Um, he was pneumoseptic at the time. The diagnosis was poor, very, very, very poor, um, both from the actual severity of his cancer diagnosis and, of course, the severity of his sepsis. Um, we actually, we got him turned around, but he stayed in the unit with us for several, several months, and he was completely 100% of the time dependent on BiPAP. Um, and forgive me if I get emotional, because this is a patient family that I got very, very, very attached to during his stay. Um, he was actually in the unit for a little bit less than six months. Um, and during that time, we kind of alternated all taking care of him and his family. Uh, had a wife and two young kids, and he, he really had a hunger to live. Um, very unfair situation. But So to utilize comfort theory for this case study, we're going to move on down. I'm not sure if you can actually see this, but this is the taxonomic um, structure that we talked about earlier for comfort theory. And this is specific for our case study patient. So in the physical need, this patient was experiencing pain. I mean, he had bone pain. He was eaten up with metastatic bone cancer. He was short of breath. Um, he was a 37-year-old male who farmed for a living and had always been independent, um, who was now incontinent, bedridden. Um, to move forward with his psycho-spiritual needs over here, he was anxious. Um, he didn't want to die. He was scared. His environmental context, he was in a cold ICU that was noisy. He had constant input from nurses, doctors, techs. Um, and then, of course, his sociocultural input, um, he hadn't seen his kids in weeks. You know, we didn't allow kids in the unit. Um, of course, we kind of manipulated that later in his diagnosis um, for his comfort. But uh, this is a guy that's going through a lot, so you can see where he would benefit from comfort theory. So, again, just moving through the taxonomic structure, we're going to try to alleviate the needs that he has personally expressed. So in the physical need, that of course is trying to alleviate his pain, encouraging BiPAP use, um, and as he tolerates it, um, trying to encourage him to work with the oncologist um, for different chemo, radiation, whatever it is that he wants to do for his diagnosis that is going to lead him the way he wants to go. I'm not gonna get completely into this, but 
Um, his comfort in interventions are available here. Um, essentially, like I said, to relate it to nursing practice, this is basically a care plan that you develop for your patient. Moving on. Now, comfort theory for providers. Um, providers typically have you know, less of an interaction with patients uh, than do the bedside nurses, but that does not mean that comfort theory is not applicable uh, for providers because they're going to be, uh, they're going to have questions about their diagnosis. They're going to come to you for comfort and answers and reassurance. And it's definitely um, something that you can utilize in your care. Um, much of this presentation has been kind of centered on bedside nursing care, um, but take home points that I want you to consider for uh, providers. Um, definitely consider comfort, the patient's actual comfort when you're doing your assessments, when you're doing your orders, um, because this may mean rescheduling treatments to allow a patient more rest. It may mean, um, you know, if I'm putting in a, a sub-Q order for Lovenox or heparin or whatever it is, if it means rescheduling that um, so that we don't have to wake the patient up at 3 a.m. to give a sub-Q injection and allow them to get more rest, then it's not going to hurt the patient to reschedule it. Just more focused on their comfort. Um, when you're doing order sets, of course, making sure that they have anxiolytics, um, analgesics, you know, just really paying attention to what this patient has expressed as comfort needs. And just to go back really quickly to David, to our comfort, our case study, um, we, we bent a lot of rules for this patient to make him more comfortable. Um, we, uh, we wound up, you know, allowing his kids to come see him in the unit basically whenever he wanted them, whenever they wanted him to, um, encouraging his comfort by kind of running a lab out of the room when he decided that he was done with treatment um, then when doctors had kind of discussed with him and told him that his prognosis was not getting any better, like he was very, very much nearing the end of his life, um, he dictated his care. And as nurses and as a provider taking care of him, we respected that. We let him dictate the manner of his care. That's what nursing and that's what advanced practice is about, is about holism, is about treating the patient as a whole. Um, when he decided that he didn't want to wear his BiPAP anymore. It was too much pressure. Um, we knew that taking off that BiPAP would generally mean the almost immediate end of his life. Um, we rationalized with him that if we could kind of cut down the pressures to a comfortable level for him, would he wear it? He did. Um, were his sats where we wanted him to be? Absolutely not. He was comfortable. Um, you know, we, of course, administered morphine for his pain, Ativan as he needed it for anxiety. Um, and his children and his wife were in the room with him um, way past it is about hours and it, it didn't matter because he was comfortable. Um, we arranged his care around him and that's, that's what this should be about is, is about the person, not about the diagnosis. So please take that home as providers that it is about the person you're taking care of. Um, it's more about their physical diagnosis. It's about what they're experiencing and all of these different realms of comfort. Um, so just to close, um, the comfortline.com, which is Dr. Catherine Kolkaba's uh, website, it has a bunch of resources available. Um, of course, different kind of general comfort questionnaire questions that you can use to apply to your patients, um, available in a variety of languages, a variety of topics. Um, and again, just take home points from this. This is so widely applicable and so simple to apply. It, it would be it would be a disservice to your patients to not apply comfort theory. Um, it mirrors the nursing process, so it's something we're all um, very, very familiar with. It's effective. There are multiple studies that show the effectiveness of comfort theory. Um, whether it's a hospice patient or not, whether it's gonna be you know, an outpatient procedure and you're not gonna see this patient again, or um, even if it's on the outpatient basis, primary care, you can still apply comfort theory. Um, very supported by research, and it's modifiable to different cultures, languages, and patient populations that we've discussed multiple times. Um, again, uh, www.thecomfortline.com is Dr. Catherine Kolkava's specific uh, website related to comfort theory. Multiple resources available there. I hope I didn't stutter or um too much during this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And again, please, please apply comfort theory to your patient populations. Thank you.